interview. Yep, we've got lines. Lines are a good thing. <laughs> and it's not blinking. That was the big signature. Mm. The other fun is that I can edit this. Yep. <laughs> um, so actually, if you wanted to introduce yourself. Uh, Venerable Ocean of Wisdom, Sakya. Uh, I'm the abbot of the Middle Way Meditation Centers and the Middle Way Peace Order. Uh, and I'm a Buddhist priest. I used to be a Buddhist monk, but now I'm a Buddhist priest. Okay. And we're using some Western words because they're familiar with Westerners, you know, uh, but they can still be confusing sometimes. Oh, completely <coughs> understood. Do you know the difference between a priest versus a monk? Everything, as far as clergy goes, everything is based off of uh, level of precepts and type of precepts mm -hmm. that you've taken. So. Monks take something called the Vinaya. The Vinaya are the rules for monks, uh, and that applies to males and females. Uh, and those rules, kind of cutting to the chase, are generally you're cloistered, you're living in a monastery, you're not working, you're celibate. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the key, you know, that, what are the, those things. Um, you don't really own anything beyond the seven requisite items. and. Um, and that's kind of the monastic life. If you're a priest, uh, you take a set of precepts called the Bodhisattva or the Bodhicitta precepts. And those precepts, um, you could, if you wanted to live a cloistered life that way, uh, and, uh, but they don't require you to, so you can work mm -hmm. if you want to. Most priests are in Japan there are some, some other forms like lamas. There's some lamas in Tibetan Buddhism, which would be kind of equivalent to a priest, okay. um, a Buddhist priest, if you will, as well, who live lives, are married, they work, etc., and they're also uh, clergy at the same time. So the key difference is really the set and the amount of precepts that you're taking. Okay. And in the Mahayana tradition, uh, the Mahayana tradition has priests, the Theravada tradition does not. Um, in the Mahayana tradition, the monks in the Mahayana tradition take both set of precepts. Okay. So they take the Vinaya and they take the Bodhisattva precepts. Okay. Very nice. So obviously we are discussing Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> First question, what is your religion? We're going to go with that. Mm -hmm. um, now, were you born into the religion or did you find it? No, I was, uh, uh, I was, well, I wasn't. But my father w was always very kind of Zen, if you will. Um, I mean, he didn't. He never studied Zen. He never promoted Zen. But a lot of his attitudes about things, I think, kind of rubbed off. So I, I can't say that I was born into the Buddhist religion, but there were certain attitudes my father had that that were similar to Buddhist perspectives. Okay. Um, I didn't get involved with Buddhism until uh, I got into college. And uh, I have two degrees in psychology. Uh, I was studying psychology and uh, kind of got intrigued because ultimately Buddhism comes down to nature of mind. And just making a long story short, began to kind of study the nature of mind through the vehicle of Western psychology and through the vehicle of Buddhism. Okay. Um, basically, how would you describe your religion? Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, Buddhism is all about the elimination of stress. Sign me up. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need that. Um, now, do you um, regularly re attend religious services, and if so, where and how often? Uh, I regularly lead religious yeah. services. Um, yeah, we meet. We meet once a week for meditation and. Because we're dealing with Western communities, we kind of change some things around a bit. Uh, Buddhism is kind of like water. It flows into the new container, which is the culture, and then kind of adapts to whatever's there. Um, so some people come to practice meditation, you know, and they don't want nothing to do with religion. Okay. And then we have some people who come and they really want religious emotion to be met. So what we do is we have... In our particular way we're doing it here is, is we, the first, the first week that we meet of a month, we do a full traditional service. Okay. Um, so what you would find if you went into a Chinese temple, a Japanese <laughs> temple, or something, something similar to what okay. you would find. And, uh, and then the rest of the month we just meditate. Okay. 
and and uh, that seems to kind of meet the needs of everybody who's coming. Okay. Um, well, obviously, it's, can you describe a typical religious service? Does it begin and end at a certain time? Is it held on a specific day? The well, it's, you know, meditation can be done on any day, and as an individual practitioner, one can do a full service every day if they wanted to. That was part of their center or not, but. When we do a service, we start with what are called, uh, we do an incense offering. It's followed by taking the refuges, refuge in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. And then after that, we chant the Heart Sutra. This is in the Mahayana tradition. We chant the Heart Sutra. And in our particular tradition, that's followed with chanting Om Mani Padme Hum, which is a mantra um, for cultivating compassion, and which follows the Heart Sutra, which is the epitome of wisdom. Those are two key elements in Buddhism. And then after that, we meditate, and um, there will be either a Dharma talk, so the leader will lead a talk, or there will be a precepts recitation component to the service. Then after that, we take the Bodhisattva vows together as a community. Then we do... Um, share the merits of our practice we give her in Mahayana we give the merits of everything we've done away okay. so we don't hold on to our good fortune for ourselves we give it away to all beings okay. and then a closing or capping verse depending upon the tradition that you're in okay. you're signing me up more and more <laughs> um, is there a religious authority or hierarchy within it such as like Catholicism with the Pope and so not on? not like the Pope um, the, a lot of people think His Holiness the Dalai Lama is like the Buddhist Pope, uh, but he's not. He's the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the head of the Gelug school of Tibetan Buddhism. Mm -hmm. There's actually four schools of Tibetan Buddhism. He's the head of one. Okay. Um, but Buddhism, there is a hierarchy, but, but you know, it really it varies a lot. Um, in East Asian Buddhism, since Confucianism has kind of merged a lot, there's a, a strong sense of hierarchy, and I kind of have to say yes, but yeah, um, you know, you you can there there's there's no monumental structure. It's more it's more if you you go into Chinese Buddhism or you go into Japanese Buddhism, and, and then the hierarchies that exist within those systems are the ones that you're dealing with. Okay. Um, but as far as Buddhism goes, uh, any teacher is, you know, we're not very parochial. Mm -hmm. For example, I've studied uh, for many, many years with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, even though he's not in my tradition. Yeah. So we're not parochial that way. We'll take, we'll go, he's Vajrayana, although my tradition has a thread of Vajrayana as well. Um, so he's Vajrayana, we'll go get teachings from him. Maybe a Chinese monk's giving teachings, so I might go and listen to a Chinese monk. Um, maybe my own, somebody in my own tradition will give a teaching and all. So it's, it, it's a, a lot less structured. structured that way. It's more individuals. For example, if I were to go to a temple, a Chinese temple, then I'm into that structure there. Um, but we don't have like you know dioceses and, okay. and, and things like that. Okay. Um, can you describe what takes place at your most significant religious ceremony? I guess the biggest one would be Vesak because Vesak is enjoyed by all of um, all Buddhist traditions uh, celebrate Vesak, and Vesak is depending upon the tradition uh, the celebration of the birth, uh, the birth. Uh, Birth, death, and enlightenment of the Buddha, or birth, enlightenment, and death of the Buddha, um, recognition, uh, and um, that happens in May, ish, because we follow a lunar calendar, so dates change. It's kind of annoying, actually, <laughs> but uh, it's like why can't it just be this date every year? Um, and uh, that is the tradition that's shared by all of the Buddhists who do Vesak, because it will be very if you go to a Laos temple, yep. you know. Um, it will be a little bit different, but one thing that's consistent across all of those is what's called the bathing of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a, a baby Buddha statue, and basically you go up with a ladle and you bathe the Buddha. Okay. And it's pretty consistent across all traditions, and it's symbolic. It's kind of like a New Year's type mm -hmm. of resolution thing. You know, you're washing away the old, you're you're resetting yourself upright again, okay. and you're cleansing and, and things like that. 
and at these events, um, there's always a Dharma talk, so there's always some sort of major teaching given. Um, and depending upon where in the U.S. a lot in Vasek, Vasek's actually part Buddhist and part like talent show. So, <laughs> okay. so you'll have uh, when I was when I was a train when I was a monk and I was at the Vietnamese temple. Like we had Vasek, and in the morning we would do the Vasek service and you know, light candles and teacher would give a dharma talk and then it would be like four hours of people singing and doing skits and all that type of stuff like that but that's a lot because in the united states the buddhist temples are also basically the cultural centers yeah as well okay um do you feel like you experienced any particular challenges or obstacles due to being a buddhist oh yeah um i'm experiencing one now um people don't like honesty um and they, they're very un, uncomfortable with people who are ethical. Um, and uh, that was so severe that I was actually moved from one school to another school because people were uncomfortable that I was ethical because mm -hmm. they wanted to be unethical. Yeah. And, and, and so somehow I was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> because they all wanted to use profanity and lie and do these other things and and when and and I'm not like the pontificating you know yeah. Buddhist I'd be like you know I had a colleague say at lunch once you know I'm going to um, I'm gonna call the pharmacy and lie to them and tell them that my husband's gonna pick up my medication and um, the uh, uh, she doesn't have a husband uh, and she has a living boyfriend, but she doesn't have a, have a husband. And regardless, yeah. you know, it's still a lie. So I just said, well, you know, lying's not really ethical. I wouldn't do it. And she turns to me and she says, Wisdom, I don't have the problems with lying that you do. Um, and, and, and then that later on became an issue because people are like, Wisdom annoys me because he's ethical. You know, and, and that bothers me and he makes me feel uncomfortable. They have a bigger question to answer for themselves. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I had a, I had another colleague that was using a lot of pro profanity, and, and I asked them, because, you know, my colleagues know I'm clergy. Mm -hmm. So you would think just that alone would make people kind of think it through. I mean, I don't want people walking on eggshells or anything, but come on, you know, it's a professional space, you know. And, uh, and yeah, and they, they got up, they complained that I was asking them to stop using profanity. And, and I was like, okay, first of all, it's not ethical. Second of all, I would think you would at least respect the fact that I'm clergy and not use it around me. Okay. Third of all, it's illegal in a public space to use it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how is it, you know, and, and it wasn't something like, you know, like every time it happened, I was saying yeah. something about it, but, but it was like, you know, um, kind of respect that, that type of professional boundary. Okay. I mean, it's not even that I'm clergy, that's a professional yeah. boundary as well. So yeah, and then, and then when all these things came up, it was like, yeah, you're, you're a problem, you annoy people. I'm like, okay, wait a second. That's like the guy who says, I think we should stop killing the Jews. You know, and, and, and you're saying, well, you're being a problem now. You're, you're yeah. annoying people by telling them to stop killing the Jews. You know, it, it's I, up. <laughs> yeah, it, it, so, so yeah, so I would say the biggest issue, you know, people look at me like I'm a freak sometimes because I don't even use, um, the second precept is to abstain from taking things not given. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's it's worded that way on purpose because it doesn't just say don't steal. Yeah. It's to abstain from not ta to, from taking things not given. <laughs> and uh, and so when I when I would use the copier at work for my own stuff, I would bring my own paper. Mm -hmm. So I bring my own paper and and I would ask, can I use the copy? This is a personal thing. Yeah. Can I use the copier? For, for this and people were just like that's the most freakish thing I've seen and I'm like I have no right to this paper it's not mm -hmm. it's not mine and I've asked and a lot of times and sometimes I've asked can I use a copy and people say yeah don't worry about your own paper do you know you, yeah. you, you know you, you can use the paper here but I still there's something about it like it's still it's not my paper you know yep. someone else paid for that so I still bring in the ream of paper yeah. and <laughs> I completely understand you know so I would say that's that's really um, yeah, being vegetarian, uh, ironically rubs some people wrong, uh, uh, 
you know, not always. Uh, but, and again, it's not a thing where you're running around telling everybody to be vegetarian. People tend to take more of an interest in you about it than you yeah. promote it, if you will. So I can say that there's, there's, you know, I would really say that the ethical components, and particularly around lying, okay. you know, you know, I've seen institutions do things that are just, um, they're just blatantly unethical. I mean, not, not only unethical from a Buddhist perspective, unethical, I, I've, as you might imagine, a lot of my friends are against what? Clergy. Mm -hmm. So, so, and I've talked to them. I said, yeah, this thing's going on, and what do you guys take on this? This is our take from a Buddhist perspective. I'm like, no, yeah, that's lying. <laughs> you know, that, that's not ethical. And then, so I would go to approach people about that, and, and I would say, you know, just so you know, it's just not, you know, the, 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 the wacky mm -hmm. religious minority who's saying this. The people from the majority wrong? religion are also saying that, and I'm told, I'm not going to discuss this anymore with you. <laughs> a similar conversation about that. It yeah. worked my work job this morning because they I had a client call about an order that they wanted to place and the year previous the manager had done what she could to make money. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily the company standard yeah. in any way. And there was no way I could meet the same mm -hmm. match. You know, in ethically do my job mm -hmm. it is the company standard we can't double things i can't cut prices yeah. any farther than they were and she was not pleased with that mm -hmm. and she assumed that she could bully me into a lower yeah. price yeah. in which it did not work yeah. um yeah. therefore she wanted to go higher thinking that she yeah. could bully higher yeah. up yeah. and my boss and i were at the same viewpoint yeah. of i pride my company as well as my job versus mm -hmm. making one person yeah. that much more satisfied ironically is a doctor yeah ordering large amounts of chocolate <laughs> um, but again yes. really did her darndest to yeah. get in there and yeah. really try to get me to bend as many rules for her as possible mm -hmm. entitlement and exactly and I'm, it just was my boss is like i'm very proud of the fact that you did not bet i'm like no mm -hmm. i love my company it's a good prop company mm -hmm. And I have no qualms about saying no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand what the rules are. It's been the same rules mm -hmm. for eight years that I've worked there. Mm -hmm. But again, it's one person that's like, but it's me. That's fabulous. I love that you're a doctor, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm a retail manager. I only have so many rules. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they are not going to work mm -hmm. for the situation. Um, now, my next question would be, are, there, are you open with others about your religion? Yeah. Yeah, I don't... Uh uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, have part of part of my house is a temple. Okay. So it's kind of hard well, to hide that thing. Like, hi, how are you coming? How are you like the three foot Buddha statue? You know? <laughs> Welcome to my church. Welcome to my living room. <laughs> that, that would definitely stand out a little bit. <laughs> um, now, I'm assuming that you don't necessarily practice more than one religion, but obviously you yeah. said that you follow more than one. <clears throat> area of Buddhism, but or at least you'll go into different... Well, I, I'm, I am, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with religion mm -hmm. and the sacred, if you will. Um, that term actually, I was first exposed to the notion of simply calling it the sacred back in, uh, Mircea Eliade wrote a book called The Sacred and the Profane, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm fascinated with religion as a vehicle for personal growth, just as I am with psychology as a mm -hmm. vehicle for personal growth. Um, so the advantage that I've found with that is that I have an ability, I'm, I'm actually a lot of people are very surprised, very well, very well versed in theology. Um, and so my ability to kind of spin that in a, in a culture that's predominantly, at least in name Christian, mm -hmm. um, I've found to be very useful. And I'm very moved by, you know, Rumi's an Islamic mystic. I'm very moved by his poetry. It's very interesting, actually. I'm not a big poetry guy. I, I've never been, you know, like whenever I was in school, like, we're going to do poetry now. I'm like, oh, just You're hang like, me now. Me, now. Take yeah, yeah, it's, please. Uh, but, but, but spiritual poetry, I don't know what, uh, there's, there's stuff about spiritual poetry that strikes me. Okay. You know, so Robert Frost, the, the path less chosen, not so much for me, yeah. but, but, but spiritual poetry, you know, probably because I would think because, you know, there's things in your own spiritual experience that re will resonate regardless of who writes it. And I think that poetry, particularly poets, poetry that comes from mystics, mm -hmm. really connects to the sacred in a way that a lot of other things don't. Okay. Um, so 
I'm not a, a you know a lot of times I'll I'll go back and forth in if I do a Dharma talk, I'll say here's this concept in Christianity or okay. in Islam and here's how we we might look at it from a Buddhist perspective. This is how it's useful, etc. So, okay. um, so I don't practice a, another tradition, but I'm well versed in it. Versed in it. Well, you gotta round it out. Mm-hmm. I completely because you never truly. I was raised Roman Catholic myself. Mm-hmm. My wife's Catholic, um, mm-hmm. but in reality, um, my parents by the time I came around were very lax <laughs> Roman Catholic. Um, so I was given the advantage of being able to just kind of follow my own mm-hmm. path. Um, so I spent most of my teen years with Wiccans, mm-hmm. with um, Judaism, with mm-hmm. Catholicism, mm-hmm. and was able to kind of piece my own together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the advantage is, is that through the years, <laughs> and as of this course, I've luckily been able to realize that it follows very similar to the Buddhist paths mm-hmm. of, you know, a lot of the not necessary attachments of things mm-hmm. and trying to just let things go. Mm-hmm. Um, I joke around about being an Irish redhead Scorpio <laughs> because I do have a temper. <laughs> but as I get older, and I knew when I was younger, it was definitely learning to let it go. Mm-hmm. And at work currently, me and one of my key holders is letting things go. Mm-hmm. Our workplace is our safe place mm-hmm. because it's we're chocolate. Chocolate is fun. Chocolate <laughs> is happy. And we can tell her, we're like, it's a Zen place. Check it at the door. We are here to do what we need to do and not deal with boyfriends or mm-hmm. or bills or, you know, it's this, is, everything else is outside of mm-hmm. our doors. And so <laughs> we've, we've created our own little temple of a chocolate <laughs> store <laughs> in our thing. So it, it was definitely an interesting point to be able to sit, sit down and learn about all the different interests and would love to continue talking at a later point in time mm. about this as I am, you've piqued my interest even farther. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I think I can... Yeah, we're going to...